Philippians chapter number 1. We can begin reading verse number 27. <clears throat> the Bible says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now you hear to be in me. Now, in these verses... The Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Philippi, inspired by the Holy Ghost. We can't cover the first 26 verses, or we'll be here until Jesus comes back. But, I just want to give you a thought. Out of these four verses, first, in verse number 27, he says, Only. Okay? Only is a real simple word. It means that what he's getting ready to say, that's what you include, and anything else, you don't include. Right? If I were to tell you to only sit there, don't stand up. Right? Or if I was to say, everybody needs to only stand for the rest of Sunday school, some of y'all would look at me like I was crazy. But what I would want is everybody standing and nobody sitting. Right? It is an exclusionary term. So when he says, only let your conversation, he's not talking about what you're saying. Okay? The definition of the word conversation Right, is what today we would refer to as our testimony. Your conversation is more than just what you say, it's how you live. So he says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Okay, now if we were to, that word becometh, right, means to glorify, to beautify, to magnify, right, to increase. Right, to only do good towards something. Okay, to be complementary is the most literal definition of that word becometh in context. So for instance, back in ye olden times, right, if you were to say that somebody's outfit became them, it would say, hey, you look good in that outfit. Right, you look the same, but that outfit looks good on you. Right? It improves your appearance. Okay, well, what does it mean for our conversation to become the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is perfect. Right? It's without flaw. It's the most beautiful, most delightful story that's ever been handed down from generation to generation. How can we make the gospel sound any better? Well, you can't. Right? But your conversation can say how special you think the gospel really is. Right? We can't increase, we can't magna, you know, change, we can't make the gospel any better. It's perfect. But what can we do? We can put it on the best platter that we can. We can put the best decoration around it with our life and our testimony to where somebody will say, hey, somebody thinks that thing on that plate over there is pretty special. Right? They didn't put out, you know, what's that? I can't remember the name of the... Chinette wasn't that the old disposable place where they're like, oh, it's better than paper plates. But no, no, they didn't break out Chinette. They put it on China plates, right? Or they put out the silver platter, right? They think something special of the gospel, right? To become the gospel is to let others know how much you revere the gospel, how much you're willing to do to protect your right to go out and share the gospel. Right? Your whole converse, your testimony should be that the most precious thing in your life and the most solemn responsibility in your life is to go out and share the gospel with other people. Your conversation becomes the gospel when the people know that you care about the gospel and that you're willing to tell other people about the gospel. And that, short of being thrown in prison, nothing's going to stop you from sharing the gospel. But even in your prison, you got people share it with in there. Right? Well, he says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast 
in one spirit. Well, what's he saying? Well, if your life, if your testimony is one that magnifies, that glorifies, that presents the gospel in the best light that it can, right, to show how much you'd really care about the gospel, he's saying whether he's able to come visit them in person, whether he hears about it from somebody else, that if your life becomes the gospel, you're going to do these three things that he's getting ready to say. Because he says, if your life becometh the gospel, I know I'm going to hear these things, no matter where I'm at, no matter who tells me. He says, this is going to be the report that we hear back about the church at Philippi, if your life becometh the gospel. He says, first, standing fast in one spirit. Right, what's that? Well, one, that's faithfulness. You're standing fast. Right, but you're standing fast in unity. Not divided. It's not... One person over here fighting by themselves, one person over here fighting on their front. No, no, no. It would be one church unified, standing together. In solidarity. For what purpose? To go and share the gospel. Right? The Great Commission. But then, not only does he say standing fast in one spirit, he says, with one mind, striving together. And that's one thing to all have one spirit for instance everybody could come in today set on the fact that we was going to worship that we could all have our spirits in line with the spirit of the Holy Ghost that we're supposed to come out on the Lord's day we're supposed to worship unreservedly give back to Christ on this day that most holy not because today was the day he got up but we celebrate every Sunday because he got up out of the ground Right, well, we could come in with that mindset, you know, that purpose. But just because you've got that set in your spirit, right, doesn't mean that your mind's going to be in the same place that somebody else's is when they come into the door. Okay, it doesn't mean that all throughout the week you've had the exact same week that somebody else has and you've been dealing and wrestling with those. What did our pastors say on Wednesday night? Did he not say that most of what we fight, it's right here. Right? You ever wake up and intend to do something that day, but then your mind gets off track and you don't end up doing it? Right? Not even at the beginning. Some of y'all say, oh, I think I'm going to go do that. And then before you finish the conversation, you done forgot about it. Right? Don't tell the past. I cannot find the gift card that I bought him for Father's Day this morning. I don't know where it is right now. I got a few guesses, but as of right now, it is uh, incognito and it's missing. Okay. I'll find it eventually. But things that you intend to do, right? But what happens? You're not of one mind. Right? That's why when he also, he being the Apostle Paul, was inspired to write to other churches, he said that to be of one might and in one accord. Right? To be of one spirit, but we've all got the same ambition. But to be of one mind means we're all going about it the exact same way. I understand you may be able to do things that I can't do, and you may be able to do things that I can't do, but of one mind means that we're set on doing the, you may be laboring right here and I may be right here, but we head in that direction together. Right? Unified, not just in purpose, right, but also in the plan. Yeah, well, they're striving together for the faith of the gospel. Earlier on in this section, he talked about many of the reasons that some people preach the cause of Christ in the Apostle Paul's day and they still doing it for all them different reasons in our day right? but just because somebody says that they love Jesus just because somebody says that they're your friend just because somebody comes through the door and says that they want to become you know, a candidate for membership at the Emmanuel Baptist Church doesn't mean that they've got the same ambitions and the same drives that you do you know what the purpose of the church should be to continue what the person that founded it, that'd be Jesus, by the way, started it for, to share the message of Christ. Now, can the church do other good? Oh, yeah, Bob talks about taking care of widows indeed.
taking care of those and helping the needy. Right? That we come in and we give of our... And if God says, hey, take from the church and give to that person over there, that's between, you know, pastor and the Holy Ghost. But if that's what the Holy Ghost says and pastor says, all right, we're going to do that. Fine by me. Right? But the main purpose is what? To strive for the cause of the gospel. Right? But he says... Just something that I noticed. Okay, he says, with one mind striving for the faith of the gospel. You're not striving to keep the gospel as true today as it was yesterday. It's still true. Nothing you do, nothing I do, is going to change the fact that the gospel is still true. Okay, nothing that we do, right? We're not preserving the way to accept the gospel. I mean, Jesus gave you the faith, right? Gave unto every man measure of faith. To believe on the story that if you believe what your Bible believes, he caused somebody to come by your way to tell you. What does that mean? All you had to do was literally trust, because he took care of everything else. Right? God could take me off the world. Guess what? He could still save people. Right? We're not changing the way that people get saved. Right, well, what are we striving for? We're striving together in one spirit and in one mind for what the faith of the gospel. When we go, that allows more people to have their faith put into the gospel. What's that mean? More people can be saved. We're just a tool that God's using. Right, but we're also striving for the faith, keeping our faith in the gospel. He said, Brother Jordan, are you saying that you can lose your salvation? No. I'm saying that deep down in the gable end of your soul, if you're going out and you're witnessing to lost people, we'll get to that here in a second. We won't say that yet. That would have been a rabbit hole. Hang on. But if you're going out and you're witnessing to people, if God's purposed in your heart to go out and hand out tracts, if God's given you a desire to pray for missionaries that they may, you know, their labor, right, may be fruitful, that God would bless their faithfulness and would bless their willingness to go that God would meet their needs why so that people can get saved that they can hear about the gospel you know what that means your faith in the gospel is just as strong as the day that it was that you got saved now once you're saved you're saved but faith is not a permanent thing faith is a choice faith is a daily decision on what you're going to believe today and what you're not going to believe today you know the people that don't go out and hand out tracts? They don't have a faith in the gospel. Are you saying they're not saved? No. I'm just saying that if they really believe that if that tract got into the hands of a lost person that Jesus would save them, and if they believe that that person being saved was as important to God as, or is as important to them as it is to God, you know what they'd be doing? They'd be handing out tracts. Faith in the gospel in this verse is not talking about your striving as a church, right? What's the requirement to get into the church? Got to be saved. Then you got to go through the outward demonstration of what happened on the inside, which is baptism, right? Baptism is for membership, not for salvation. Okay, but your one requirement to be in the church is that I got saved, and as obedience to God to show what happened on the inside, I want to get baptized. Who's he writing a letter to? The church. He's telling the church that they are striving for the, their faith of the gospel. They're already saved. So what are they striving for? They're striving to keep their flesh in line, to keep the distractions of the world away, so that they can focus on the fact that the reason Jesus started the church, the reason that he came, the reason that all the way back before the foundation of the world when Jesus was the lamb that was slain, he had one goal in mind. What was that? The gospel. He wrote it before there ever was time and he was intended to perform it according to the will of the Father since before the beginning of time. It was so perfect that God the Father okayed it. Right? And then he performed it. And then he instructed us to continue it. 
Not the plan of salvation, but the message of salvation. That's what gospel means, the good news. That Jesus came and did what he did just for you. So when he says, striving for the faith of the gospel, you want to know why some churches don't go out and knock on doors? Because they don't believe that God saved the people that they knocked the doors on. Because if they did, they'd go. Right? You want to know why some people don't support missionaries? Because they don't believe that supporting missionaries will help people get saved. Or they believe that going out knocking on doors is good, and they believe that supporting missionaries is good. They just don't believe that they should do it. You know what? They've lost their faith in the gospel. Because the gospel isn't a man made thing. Right? Romans chapter number 10. Main Romans chapter number 9, if you want to get real specific. I can take you into those two chapters to show you what it takes to be saved. It's real simple. If a man confesseth with his mouth, right, believeth in his heart, then God will save him. What's that mean? If you admit to God that you need a Savior, well, why do you need a Savior? Because you're a sinner. Right? But if you admit to God, Lord, I am a sinner, and I need a Savior. And if you believe in your heart that Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God, Son of God, came, died, shed His blood for you, got up out of the grave again three days later, and has ascended into heaven willing to save you and be your Savior. And then you ask Him. He will. That's what the Bible says. But the mouth confession is made, and the, righteous, right, and the heart man believeth unto salvation. It's not enough to believe in. There are a lot of people that believe in. We know that. Right, but there are a lot of people that believe that Jesus was the Savior. They just don't think that, he, that they need to be saved. And then on the other hand, there's a lot of people that believe, but you know what they never do? They never ask. You have to invite or accept the invitation. What's he saying? I'll save you. So what do you got to do? You got to ask him. It's, it's that simple. Whether I believe in any of that or not, that's how God still saves people. That's the plan that until the church is raptured out of here, that's the only way to be saved in this dispensation. So me believing it is not going to change whether or not it's true. My faith in the gospel is whether or not I believe that God can use me to go out and take the gospel to somebody and impact them. You know what the church is standing together for? You know why they're in one spirit? Why they're steadfastly resisting the world, resisting themselves through the flesh? You know why? The Apostle Paul says, no matter what you do, if your life becometh the gospel, I know I'll get a good report that you're doing these things. Because if your life becometh the gospel, you believe the only help for this world is the gospel. And you're going to do everything you can to take it to them. You know what that means? You're going to remove the obstacles in your life that don't become the gospel so that you can take it and be a good representation or ambassador of Christ. But we're not going to teach on any of that. Verse number 28 is where we're going to take our thought from. But we had to get through all that. Yeah, you've just been talking about faith. Keep that in mind. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Well, did he not say at the end of verse number 27, striving together for the faith, right? Standing fast in one spirit. What's that mean? Well, you don't have to strive if there's no opposition. You don't have to stand fast if there isn't somebody trying to get you to move. Right? Well, who are our opposite? Well, verse number 28. Our adversaries. Plural. Now we know that Peter wrote that your adversary, singular, the devil. Well, who are the adversaries? Those that follow the doctrines of the devil. Don't necessarily have to be, you know, demon. It just means that they have to have the same mindset that the devil had, which is what? My right to my claim to myself. God's not God. I'm the God of my life. But we can boil it down to all that which essentially is just humanism. Don't get me started on that. We'll be here for another two weeks. Don't get me started on all that junk. But our adversaries, 
right? Those that withstand the gospel. Just because somebody doesn't like me doesn't mean they're an adversary to the gospel, right? There's a whole lot of reasons that people won't like me, right? Doesn't surprise me. And sometimes I don't even blame them, Brother Tommy, right? But there are some people that just don't like me because of me. That may be my fault, okay? May, we're not saying it is. Okay, haven't thought about that one too much. God hadn't convicted me on it yet, okay? But, he says, adversaries of the gospel, those that want to keep you from going out and sharing the good news of Jesus, those that want to take away your right to go out and have free speech and to share your religious freedom with other people, those that would stand in your way, prevent you, try to, you know, make it illegal to do certain things, those that may physically stand in your way and say, you're not going in there and sharing whatever it is that you want to share. Those that will heckle you from the sidelines to try and break your will to go out and share the gospel or to live for the gospel. Right? Just to change what you believe about the gospel, just a little bit. Right? Who are those? Those are our adversaries. He says, right, and in nothing being terrified by, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. You know who the son of perdition is? The Antichrist. Well, if they have an evident token of perdition, what's that mean? They have the spirit of Antichrist. You want to know how we know where somebody's from nowadays? You can ask them for their driver's license. It's got state and it's got an address on it. Right? That was issued by somebody else as a token of this person lives here. Right? Our state approved them to drive a vehicle, which some of them should have it revoked. But... It's a token of the fact that you're from Kentucky or Indiana or, in, or Ohio or West Virginia, like Sister Billy was originally. But guess what? When she moved to Kentucky, she had to get a Kentucky license. Why? Because it's a token of where you are right now, right? Where you reside. Well, what's this token of perdition? It's a token of where they're at right now. Some of us used to be, you know, on the side of perdition. Right? We were very anti-Christ before we got saved. Right? But the token or the evident token, as he says, proof that somebody isn't right with God at the minimum, but most likely if somebody withstands the gospel, wants to keep you from going out and sharing it, there's a good sign they need to get saved. Why? Because it's the spirit of anti-Christ. It's an evident token of perdition. So he's saying, staying fast against those that want to keep you from going out and sharing the gospel, want you to back up on the gospel, want you to just, you know, take it a little bit easier. Why? Because a little bit today is a whole lot down the road. He said, that is an evident sign of perdition. In other words, he's saying, if somebody wants you to stop taking the gospel, wants you to stop being so enthusiastic about the gospel, he says, you don't even have to pray on it. It's an evident sign of the fact that that's Antichrist and you need to withstand it. Not Jordan's opinion. This is what the Bible says. What are we standing against? Adversaries. What do our adversaries do? Well, they, the adversary, what's he want to stop? The devil wants to keep you from going out and telling people about Jesus. Well, an evident sign that that person has the same spirit in them that the devil has is that they don't want you taking the gospel out. They want you to not be able to take it, or they just want you to stop talking about the gospel. It's an evident sign of the fact that they got the same spirit in them that the devil has within him. And one day the Antichrist will have. Well, well, he says, but unto us of salvation and that of God. He says, when somebody stands against you taking the gospel out, it's a sign of the fact that they're of the devil. May not be demon possessed, but they got something in them that's in the devil. Maybe sin. Right? May just be the fact that they're under conviction and they want you to stop talking about it because God's got a good grip on them. Well, what's that a sign of? That they need Jesus. But when we come against opposition, right? That's what opposition says about our oppressors, right? Or our adversaries. But what does opposition say about us? Well, unto us 
it proves two things. One, that we're on the right track. That the devil only fights or resists that which he fears. If he's not worried about you, he's going to leave you alone and do whatever you want to. It's no consequence to him. But any time the church is going out, what happens? The devil is it, but the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. What's he do? He sets up opposition. He sets up adversaries. He sets up gates. Right? They're a defensive measure. But guess what? If Jesus tells you to go, the gates can't stop the church of the living God. Right? But it also, unto us, is a token of God. When we face opposition, when we face adversaries, what we are doing is fulfilling the call that Jesus put on your life. Did he not say to be holy because he is holy? Were they not called Christians because they took to heart the fact that they wanted to be like Christ and others saw that they were like Christ? So at Antioch they said, we're going to start calling y'all Christians because you live like Jesus did. Your life reminds us of Jesus. You know what their life was? It became the gospel. Right? It becometh the gospel, as we read in verse number 27. It complemented the gospel. So much so that they said, you talk like Christ talked. You know what Christ always talked about? The plan that God put together called salvation. And guess what that is? The gospel. Telling other people about how much they needed to believe on the Savior and all the while fulfilling everything that they needed to be done to be their Savior. Okay, talk about multitasking, right? But unto us it's a token of the fact that we're living as God wants us to live. Look at verse number 29. For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Jesus warned us. He said the world hated him the world's going to hate us. He said that his yoke was easy and his burden was light. You know why? Because really when they hate me, they're not hating me, they're hating him. I've just got to deal with the with the, the loud noises. right? I've got to deal with the people that are upset. But really, he's the one that's suffering the indignation. He's the one that bears the shame of the fact that they won't believe on something that he so clearly did for them. He's the one that they're rejecting. They're not rejecting me. But he said that they hated him. And that they, they does. He said that if you go out and you tell them about me, you're going to suffer some persecution. Right? Not what we have to deal with nowadays, right? with rejection or where we feel ashamed because somebody you know, said something, this, that. No, no, no. He's talking about people being thrown in jail, beheaded, given to lions in the middle of the Colosseum and torn into parts and pieces. He's talking about those that were burned at the stake because they would not renounce the fact that Jesus was Christ and more importantly, a lot of them were burned at the stake because they wouldn't, you know, accept infant baptism. That's a little history lesson for you. If you want to know more about it, come see me later. That's what the whole Spanish Inquisition was about. But why? Because we cling to what Jesus said and not what the man says. I don't think you need to add anything to what Jesus did, and I certainly don't think you need to take anything away from what Jesus did in order to change what the gospel is. But when those come against us in opposite, they were opposition against them. So when we have opposition against us, what's that a sign of? That we're following in his footsteps. It's a token unto us that our obedience towards God. Yeah, it's not going to be easy, but he promised that he'd take every step with you. Again, not going to teach on that either. But verse number 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. That word terrified is a unique word. Depending on which dictionary you look it up in. I, at first I started with terrified, but I'm like, oh, let's just see if it's different if you search terrified. Terrified means, means literally, right, to feel terror. And I'm like, thank you, dictionary. That was real helpful. I appreciate that. Right? Well, what's that mean? You've got to go back a few words in the page. Right? But to terrify somebody means that you shock them by fear or surprise. You know what shock means? You immobilize them. If somebody's terrified, they don't move. 
They don't scream. They're afraid to breathe if you're terrified. But that whole flight or flight thing, that, that's a lie because sometimes people freeze. They're so scared they don't want to do anything. But well, verse number 20, he says, and, and no, nothing be terrified by your adversaries. You know what the adversary can't do? Change the gospel. Keep the gospel from being true. Keep the gospel from helping a lost soul. If the gospel is received by somebody and God starts working on it in their heart, that if they listen and they actually start, and the Holy Ghost starts putting them under conviction, you know what the devil can do to stop them from getting saved? Absolutely zero. He could try and intimidate them, just like we're going to talk about here in a second. He could try and put people in their life to say, ah, that's just a bunch of hogwash. But really, if they get down on their knees and say, Lord, save me, you know what he can do? Nothing. That devil's powerless before the gospel. That doesn't matter what Ho Chi Minh or any of the other, you know, communist nations across the world doesn't matter what they say about the gospel if the gospel gets in and somebody hears it it could save somebody in them countries they can't stop it right they don't even need to i mean what bible you think the philippians had before the apostle paul wrote this epistle to them you know how they believe because they heard somebody else tell about jesus somebody came and preached to them and shared to them right the plan of salvation I mean, as much as I love my Bible, and you can try and take it from me, and it ain't going to be an easy fight. I will remind you, but I may not be, wasn't very athletic to start with, but I may not be as minorly athletic as I was before. I can still tackle somebody. Don't try and take my Bible. I like it so much it's got my name in it. Why? So people know it's mine. Right, this one, this is the one that I preach out of. I don't make notes in this. I, do, I don't want anything distracted while I'm up here reading my verses. It don't even have Jesus' words in red. But I've got a whole bunch of them with notes in them. Don't try and take them either. Right? And don't try to delete the app on my iPad where I do all my studying for Sunday school. That we're going to have words at a minimum. Right? And there's a good chance that in the flesh, I'd want to hurt you. Why? Because I love my Bible. In fact, when I got this as a birthday present one year, I told everybody I got a new best friend. Why? Because every time I get up here and teach, what's it? It's standing right here with me. Got a new best friend. Right? But you can take away my Bible from me, and I can still tell somebody how to get saved. Somebody that doesn't have the Bible can still hear the gospel. But they just need somebody whose life becomes the gospel to go and share it with them. As much as I love mine, those people in chat don't need one. They desire to have one. Right? People that get saved in countries all around where it's illegal to be a Christian, they desire to have what we have. But if they've got salvation, they have what we have. The same Savior inside of them that we have inside of us. But we say, there's nothing that the world can do to stop the gospel once the gospel's been shared. You know, the only tool that the devil has to keep people from getting saved is to terrify those that are supposed to go out and share the gospel. We've already said, somebody that's terrified, they don't move, they don't make a noise, and they are shocked into doing nothing. Well, what, do pe what, what are people going to think if I go out and tell Who cares? That's a tool of the devil. Why? To intimidate you into not going. You know what he's done? He's terrified you. You're too scared to go. Too scared to move. Some people will go, but some people won't tell. Well, if Jesus wants them, they'll read this guy. Well, if Jesus wants you to witness to him, Jesus wants you to witness to him. Or not to grieve or to quench the Holy Ghost. If he tells you to witness, you witness. If he tells you to shut up, shut up. Right? Same goes, by the way, for church service. If Jesus tells you to get up and sing a song, get up and sing the song. If he don't tell you to get up and sing a song, sit down and wait until he tells you to sing a song. If he don't tell you to get up and testify, don't get up and testify. But if he says get up and testify, get up and testify because I don't want you to grieve the Holy Ghost and keep the service from going on. 
But you know why people won't get up and testify when the Holy Ghost is telling them? Because they've been, they've been terrified. Something about what their flesh feels or something that they're worried about this, they're worried about that. Well, what about this? I don't know how to say it. Well, get up and he'll give you the words to say it. Sometimes there are no words. Sometimes it's just tears and shouts. Right? But when you're terrified into not doing, you're not going to find out how God's going to do it. He didn't promise that he'd tell us how he'd do it. He just promised that he'd be there with us, that he'd lead us and guide us into all truth, and that he'd let us know when he wants us to do something. Again, you know what they're striving for in one faith? The faith of the gospel. If you believe that God really saved you so that you could go out and be a witness to other people, when he gives you the opportunity, you may not want to in the flesh. You may not desire to face the ridicule that may be coming your way. But you believe that God purposed for you to tell that other, you're going to tell them. Whether your flesh wants to or doesn't want to. Whether you may be feeling the opposition or the oppression. Where your flesh is afraid, but greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You know why we don't? Because our faith in the gospel isn't stronger than our fear. Fear's real. Right? Fear of the flesh. If it, you know, people say, why are you getting still getting nervous before you get up and teach or you get up and preach? Because one, this is a place, it's not up here so that Jordan can talk. The Holy Ghost is supposed to be talking while Brother Jordan's up here. Right? So I'm trying to make sure that I don't grieve and quench what the Holy Ghost wants me to say. Right? But on top of that, it's not so much I'm nervous, there's just a weight. Sometimes it feels like I got a gorilla wrestling me on my back while I'm up here teaching. Other times it's just, you know, the way uh, I know that people probably aren't going to be too happy with what I got, you know, God wants me to say. What is that? That's the flesh. That's the devil trying to intimidate you. Well, why don't you just preach on heaven for once? I'd love to. But if Jesus said, don't preach on heaven, we ain't going to preach on heaven. You know that Jesus preached on hell twice as much as he did on heaven. And what he do? The will of the Father. Right? It's a pressure to go out and share the gospel. It may not be fear. It just may be an intimidation tactic. He is a roaring lion. Roars are pretty intimidating. You know why he roars? Because he can't come and devour you. Because God said he couldn't. So he tries to terrify you into what? Stopping. Freezing. It says, and in nothing be terrified by your adversaries. Why? Why shouldn't we be scared of those that want to keep us from doing what God wants us to do? Well, first off, if you're scared of them, you're not going to go share the gospel with them. Don't they need it just as much as anybody else? In fact, those that used to stand the most against the gospel, after they get saved, they end up doing a whole lot for Jesus. You say, where's the proof, Brother Jordan? Apostle Paul wrote this book of the Bible. He persecuted the church before he found Jesus on the road, well, before Jesus found him on the road to Damascus. Anybody in here used to hate the things of God, used to hate going to church, used to hate hearing about church, used to hate hearing any song that mentioned church or Jesus or anything else, but yet nowadays, where you find them? Up in the choir. Singing away for the honor and glory of Jesus. See him skipping down the road, handing out tracts to people on visitation. Right? You find them just hanging around the church on days that we don't have church. Why? Because they just want to be around things of God. They want to be out here mowing the grass. They just want to make the things, the place of God beautiful. Why? Because they want the church to become the purpose of the gospel. They want it to be beautiful so that people know, not that we worship a building, but because we love Jesus enough to know that we want his house to be the best house on the block. We want it to look pristine. Why? Because he gave his best for us, and so we're going to give our best for him. See, you start thinking about things that way, and it's a whole lot harder to intimidate you. It's a whole lot harder to intimidate you when you're not standing on your own, but you're in a group. You know, the easiest way for the devil to intimidate you is to isolate you. If he can get you by yourself, you think you're alone. And when you're alone, it's a whole lot easier to be intimidated. Be terrified. But see, when you're standing next to somebody, 
right? Because, again, as a church, we're fitly framed together in one body in Christ. Right? When you're standing next to somebody, guess why that person is in the church? Because God either knew that they needed to show you something and help bear your burdens, or one day you may have to bear their burdens. But he fitly framed you together so that you'd have one heart and one mind to go after the things of Christ the same way. So if you're standing next to me, unless it's a snake, Brother Mike, it's real hard to intimidate me. Okay? Like, I'd be scared of a bear, but not too scared to pull out a gun and try and shoot it. Okay? Snake, we run in the opposite direction. Okay? Bible said God cursed them, they're cursed, they're devil. Okay? Keep them away. That's just my personal opinion. Okay? Backed by the verses that I chose to reference out of the Bible. Okay, not saying that that's what the Bible says, saying that that's what I've cho chosen to use. Okay, the Bible also said put enmity between our seed, man, and the seed of the serpent. You know what that means? Enmity means it's an enemy. It needs to die. Okay. Don't care if we got a whole bunch of rabbits and mice as a result of it. I don't. I like those more than snakes. Okay. But if we're standing together. Right? I, I really don't care what people think about me. I got over that a long time ago. I care more about what God thinks about me. So when somebody's standing next to me, and they say, well, did you hear what that person said? They don't know what they're talking about. They're crazy. What do you mean? You said worse things about the gospel before you got saved or before I got saved. Right? All they're doing, that's just a sign of the fact that the devil's trying to use them for perdition, as a, in the spirit of perdition, against us. Right, some of them have been saved a little bit of time, them old timers. When they say, "Well, what you know, what do you think about this?" The Bible says that there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. Right? Hey, I need some help. I'm I'm dealing with this in my life. You got any advice? You know what the old timers are going to tell you? Like I say, they've been saying the same thing for sixty years, and they've been wrong for sixty years. They say that the gospel can't help nobody, but I've seen it help a whole lot of people in sixty years. They say that the gospel's lost its power. Guess what? It's still saving people 60 years later. You know what they were saying 2,000 years ago? That Jesus couldn't help nobody. You know what they've been doing for 2,000? They've been wrong. Right? You get around those that have been experienced these things before, you know what you're going to find? It's, he's got the same tricks. Right? That was a one-trick pony. He ran out of new things a long time ago, but you know why he still uses them? Because they work against people. You know what they don't work against? A unified church that has one mind and one spirit focused on striving for the sake of the gospel. You know the thing in this world that the devil fears the most? A church that's purposed to go out and do what Jesus wanted the church to do. He may not think that I'm much, because I'm not. He may not think that you're much. And let's be honest, we're not worth the powder it take to blow away. You know what he is scared of? Jesus. And he's scared of what Jesus wants to do. He's scared of the will of the Father being performed. Well, you know what the will of the Father is? That churches get unified. He may not be scared of you, and he may not be scared, but he is scared of us. Unified under the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Going out and doing what God, embracing the fact that God put that call on our life and going out and being a witness. You know why he wants to terrify us? Because he's terrified of you. Not individually, but he's terrified of what you can do for Jesus. He don't want you to go out. He don't want you to share. He don't want you to have a testimony that puts Jesus in the story of the gospel front and center in your life and to tell everybody else how precious it is to you. He wants you to stand alone instead of staying in together. Why? Because he's terrified of what will happen if a lost sinner hears about the glorious good news of Jesus Christ. He's terrified of what will happen if Florence right, gets hit with a spark of revival and bars start shutting down. right, And rehab centers start opening up because drug houses are closing. Then he's terrified of what Jesus could do in one church that just totally gave themselves over to the mission and the cause of Christ. He's terrified of it. That's why he fights so hard against it. Because you know what happens when God starts 
fire in a community, you know what he can do to stop it? Nothing. You know what he can do to Job's life? Nothing. God had to give him permission. You know what he can do in your life? Nothing. He's got to get permission from God. You know what he can do to resist the church of the living God? That's it. He, can res- he can't fight against it. All he can do is put up those gates, as we already talked about. The gates of hell shall not prevail. He can't wage war against the church. He can just try and stop it. And you want to know when he's got to get out the way? When Jesus kicks the gate open and says, Hey, excuse us, we're going to come in here. Same way he kicked in the door to hell and walked up to him and said, Give me the keys to death and hell. You know what the devil could do to stop all that? Nothing. You know what the devil could do to stop Jesus when the Father testified said that he, you know, you smote his heel, but he'll smite your head? You know what the devil could do when Jesus reared back and hit him in the back of the head so hard? Right, that he bruised the back of the devil's head. He couldn't do a thing. Because you know what the devil does before Jesus and before God? He falls flat down on his face because he's powerless against him. Yeah, he seems like a big lion to us. He's not even a kitty cat to God. God made him. God could have destroyed him. But instead chose to prove how just simple faith could give man everything that the devil wanted. With faith, it's all we can do. It's all that we can use to please God. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. That's why in these verses he says, if you're defending your faith in the gospel, you're going to be used of God and you're going to be used greatly. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.